I'm Boomi. And I'm Lada. And we're both former interns of WLT and self-professed book lovers. We now work at Penguin Random House, specifically in children's, and we also love to travel in our free time. This show is meant to exemplify and uplift diverse voices, and we're just so glad to have this platform and glad to have you with us for another video. Yeah, so each episode, you know you know the deal by this point, but we highlight books across picture book, middle grade, young adult. Sometimes we delve into the realm of adult, graphic novel, chapter books. It really just kind of depends on like what we're reading, what we're seeing that's out there, but um, we'll highlight one book across each main category and then, you know, sprinkle in a couple honorable mentions because we can never pick just one book. So hard to do. So this month we want to focus on MENA or Middle Eastern and North Africa uh, books from that region. And so that is the part of the country, the part of the world, excuse me, that is um, the Middle East and North Africa. So part of Asia and then the uh, non-Sub-Saharan Africa. And so this includes countries um, of Algeria, Bahrain, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Israel, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Morocco, Oman, Qatar, uh, or Qatar is what I've heard is the proper way to say that actually. Um, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Tunisia, uh, the United Arab Emirates and Yemen. And we think this should also, I think Palestine is also in there as well too. So, and I, we left that out, sorry, that was my bad. Um, and so those are the books that we want to focus on. And we thought about this just because um, this is a big discussion that was during the uh, 2020 census, people were talking about like, should this be a new category? And you know, the Middle East, um, like and North Africa has its own unique culture that is different than what people generally think of as Asia or generally think of as Africa. And so this is a sub-region um, that's not continental, but is really tied together by similar uh, culture, language, and, um, you know, yeah, culture and language, I guess, is the two things, uh, big things. And so a lot there, not everybody is Muslim, not everybody is Arab, but those are some some similarities in that area as well. Um, similar foods, similar style of clothing, you know, a lot of those things are things that we wanted to dive into, um, especially because we know that no place is a monolith. And so it's an opportunity to also like explore what does this region of the world look like? Yeah. So Bumi summed it up pretty nicely and I'm glad she summed it up because I would have butchered it a lot. Not, not as, I would not have said it nearly as well as you can see by that last sentence, which was also butchered. Um, but we're gonna start off with picture books. Um, and so my picture book selection is Salma the Syrian Chef by Danny Ramadan and illustrated by Anna Braun. So this book was really cool because it was an immigrant story. It was about this girl who um, she and her family moved to Canada and, you know, her mom's kind of lonely because she's learning the language. The daughter's you know, going to this really cool community center um, and in the center they have like a bunch of people who are kind of like transplants and they're kind of like all helping each other and like, you know, learning from each other, trying to like adapt to a new country and a new place of living. And she has this idea to make her mom like... Um, dish native to Syria, but she needs the help of the community to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, she mainly just wanted to see her mom smile again because it seemed like her mother was having a hard time adjusting, which makes sense. You're in a new country. Everything is crazy and new. Um, but the illustrations are really sweet. The message is very heartwarming. I loved seeing the community come together to make this dish. Um, and I think they had a recipe in the back. Please do not quote me if I misremember. <laughs> if not, you can Google how to make it and make it for yourself um, and have this really good Syrian dish. Um, but I just thought it was really cute. It was very heartwarming. Um, and it was interesting to kind of like see an immigrant experience, but also like still tie back to their native country and their culture. Yeah. Well, what's so funny is my picture book is also from Syria, which was not planned at all, but I had chosen The Catman of Aleppo, um, and this is by Irene Latham and Kareem Sh Shamsi Basha, and it's illustrated by Yuko um, Shimizu. And actually, uh, Kareem's the only one who's actually from Syria. The other authors are not. Um, or the other author is not. Um, she's Middle Eastern as well, but she had heard about what was happening in Syria. As we know, there has been a huge refugee crisis, and a lot of people have been leaving um, and Aleppo is one of the major cities where people lived. And so as people are leaving, there was a, a man there who uh, was an EMT 
and as people are leaving, he's noticing that they're leaving their pets behind. And like, there's a lot of stray animals, specifically cats that are just everywhere. So he decides to start like using his extra money to buy them food and bring them water and take care of them. And like, it goes from like five cats to 20 cats. And then suddenly, so then he like finds a house and basically makes it this cat house that people can drop off their animals. So as people are leaving a lipo to like go for, for safety, for different reasons, they will, um, drop their animals off with him and he takes care of them and, it be, and he now actually has two sanctuaries apparently for pets and wow. as you know real life story and uh, this book actually was nominated for quite a few awards it did not um, win any of them but like it was nominated which is really cool and it just really tells a true story of uh the cat man and that's actually like he has an instagram and everything else as, as the cat man <laughs> and it's a whole thing um and so the Irene had seen the story and fell in love with it, but also felt like this is not really my story to tell. So she ended up partnering with um, a Syrian author and together they worked on getting to know um, the Catman of Alipo, getting to really know his story and writing this book. And then the illustrator um, is um, Asian, um, but from more uh, East Asia and not um, Middle Eastern either. But similarly was like, I like dived into the research, like asked for all the pictures I could of the animals and the houses and, you know, the city and just trying to get, a, and does a great job of depicting like what the city was like before and after, and just kind of the compassion that comes from mm. our main character here. And it's just like a cute story. I don't even really like pets. I'm just gonna be really honest. I know don't hate me, but it was a cute book and I liked the book still. And I was, I still felt just the idea of, you know, what does it mean to serve in a way that you can, even in the midst of you know, disaster and conflict, he saw a need and he, and he figured out a way to help. And I think that's such a great message for kids to learn and for just humans to learn is where, you know, we can't always solve the big, big problem, but we can look around us and see um, ways that we can, you know, contribute and help. Um, even if it seems really small, he just started out by buying a little bit of food for a couple of cats and it ended up becoming, you know, a, a place of peace for so many people. Because a lot of people, as they were leaving, that was devastating for them to have to leave their you know, pets. And so this was an, a way for them to like release something um, without that like extra weight that they have to carry on emotional about baggage. So I just thought it was a really beautiful story. And you, you even get a letter from the captain as well, just talking directly from him. It's just like a really great book overall. So um, I'm sure we both read more than just one picture book though. So do you have any honorable mentions you want to bring up? I do. I, do. I read In My Mosque and then also The Librarian of Basra, which is set in Iraq. Cool. Um, I read 10 Ways to Hear Snow, which is set in the U.S., I think, but is about a Lebanese family and a little girl who's walking to her grandmother's um, house. And I love the way that they brought, like, she brings up, like, all the way her grandmother can use it. It also, like, is a little bit of disability representation. Her grandmother can't see. So that's why they're thinking about what are the ways that you hear versus see snow. Um, and then I also read Seven Special Somethings by Adib Koram, which is about the Persian New Year and just kind of celebration from a little boy's perspective. And, um, and I, I didn't know about Persian New Year at all. So that was a really fun book to read and dive into. Yeah. So I guess next is middle grade, right? Ah, uh, middle grade. Which always is my favorite. Um, I actually went a little bit younger than I normally do this time and chose to read a little bit of a chapter book series called Planet Omar. There's two of them. Uh, one of them is Planet Omar. And uh, I think it's like the accidental troublemakers like that or the accidental trouble magnet and the other one is planet omar unexpected super spy and it's about a, a boy whose family is originally from pakistan but he lives in london um now and or like in yeah i guess like london uk area um and he and his family at the in the first book have just moved to a new town uh, or new house and so he's having to change schools they're having to change their mosque they're having to just kind of change their entire life and so in book one it's really about him settling into his new school and you know there's a bit of a bully at school their neighbor is an old white lady who's kind of like oh like she'll be on the phone with her son and be like David the Muslims are doing whatever and he's just like what is wrong with her and, he, and he's probably like in second grade at the most so he's clearly like this sweet innocent like adorable child with a huge imagination like he imagines he has a dragon called h2o that like helps him with his fears and like it's a whole cute like thing and but through the course he realizes honestly that it's not really about like the bully and even this older woman it really just comes down to the fact that you don't know people right and when you don't know people's stories it's really easy to like have biases against them and to like be unkind to them but once you know them and once you actually like extend that extend that helping hand it can really change your relationship so like he helps the bully and realize the bully is not really a bully he's just a kid who's going through a hard time himself and 
you know, kind of has been labeled the bad kid. So he's just acting out that way all the way he can. And this you know, older lady just is confused um, because she's been re listening to the news a lot. And so she had these fears about what it would be like to live beside Muslims, but then they help her when something happens to her. And she immediately is like, oh my gosh, and like becomes a part of their family, joins them for Ramadan, you know, the whole thing because of that. And the second one is, you know, they ends up being about like his, the mosque that his family goes to is in danger. So it talks a lot about generosity and how the spirit of generosity can really like spread like wildfire as Omar and his friends try to raise money to save the mosque. And it's just really fun, really cute. Um, and uh, like, just made me laugh at times and made me smile. And Omar, like, I just wanted to squeeze Omar's cheeks. He's just like the sweetest little kid ever. Um, and so these, this was the Planet Omar series. And I don't think I said the author earlier, Zainab Milan. Amazing. Um, I feel like my my middle grade selection is kind of um, a little bit of a 180. Uh, it it kind of falls into the middle grade camp, but also YA camp. It's a little bit crossover. Um, it's Darius the Great is Not Okay by Adib Karam. And um, I say it falls into the middle grade camp because he's a little bit, he's like younger than like a typical teenage um, teenager, but I like the essence of this book is very much of like coming of age, identity, dealing with, you know, like your culture, but as like, um, you know, an immigrant to America or like a daughter, son of an immigrant. Um, but then also like he goes back to, I think it's, um, Iran, Iran with his family. Um, and you know, he doesn't speak the language. He's like confused and, you know, he's trying to like figure out who he's, what he is, who he is, um, you know, and he befriends this boy in the village, um, and that kind of, like, lets him get back in touch with his roots, with his family, with his culture, but then also kind of, like, still looking along the lines of, like, what is it like to be not, you know, necessarily, like, 100% Persian or 100% American, but, like, Persian-American, yeah. um, and it, like, it, there are parts of the book that were funny, but it was also very heartwarming, but also like a lot of, I feel like struggle and like angst, but yeah. like the best kind of angst because okay. he's figuring out who he is. He's figuring out what he wants to do. And there's not clear cut answers, you know, like you can't just suddenly grow up and decide, oh, this is my purpose or, oh, I will never struggle with my identity ever again. Like that's not, you know, what that kind of is. So I felt like it was a very emotional book, but like in, like I said, the best kind of way. Um, and it like really struck, stuck with me for a while after I read it. So I was like, this one, I got a highlight because yeah. there's a sequel. I have not read the sequel yet, but yeah. it's on my to be read list. So yeah, I will. It's been on mine for a while because I've seen the reviews and everybody I know who talked about it has been like, oh my gosh, Darius the Great is okay. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And as someone who, I mean, I'm not Middle Eastern or North African, but as someone who also feels like I grew up between two cultures, I've had that same struggle of like, what is my identity? And, um, and like, do I really belong here or here? And can I be both? And what does it look like to be both? And really like you're too much or not enough or whatever, all those feelings sometimes. And so, and I think that's a lot of things that a lot of kids more and more in this generation probably can experience because we just have such a global community and people tend to, you know, have, you know, interracial and multicultural families now. And so I think this like, that sounds like a great book. I'm definitely going to add it to my TBR. Yeah, no, I feel like even though I'm, you know, obviously not Iranian, um, but, you know, like being Mexican American, being the daughter of someone who immigrated from Mexico to the US, it's always been like that kind of weird of like, I'm not 100% this, I'm not 100% this, but I am 100% this. And so like any of these books, I feel like with that kind of nod to how do we fit in, always pull me in because I'm like, ooh, I'm not alone. So. Yeah. And helps me process the things I probably did not process when I was that age and should have processed it, right? So yeah. I'm like, well, cool, cool, cool. In my, I think I was in my late 20s when I read it. So I was definitely not through processing. We'll probably still be processing it for a while. I do have two honorable mentions that I want to highlight for middle grade. And the first one is Silver World by Diana Abu Jabber. And then I couldn't help but include Furthermore in Witchwood by Tara Mafi, which were kind of like a little bit, I feel like a diverse take on Alice in Wonderland. Uh, they like had like this very like ethereal, like mystical kind of like storyline that I wasn't sure I was following all the time, but I also was like fascinated the entire time. And I really loved 
just like the different nodes and modes that they put in this and that it was very magical, but also yeah. whimsical. I don't know. It was just like fun. I have furthermore on hold to the library because I wanted to read it uh, specifically for this episode and just didn't get a chance to get to it. But um, I was told that I would like it, but I've no, I don't think anyone's described it as a diverse Alice in Wonderland, which I'm like, oh, because I, that story is weird to me. Let's be real, the real Alice in Wonderland. But there's elements of it that's so fantastical that you can't help but be drawn in that I would be very interested to see what a more diverse or more modern take of that looks like. So I'm definitely going to, I'm like, now I'm going to go check my hold list and see how far away I am on it. Um, I would love to mention and call out uh, another chapter book series. And so again, going a bit on the younger end, and this is Meet Yasmin. Mm -hmm. um, and I completely forgot actually what country her family's from and uh, did not look that, that up at the moment. But um, Meet Yasmin is adorable. It is like, you know, little the cover has this little cute girl like I mean like full of energy like posing and she's just like vibrant and fun and you know talks a lot about her culture and her family and like you know what she calls her father and her mother and like and her grandparents and just kind of this whole situation and the books are kind of actually um four short stories kind of in one book and so each chapter is a short story so they can be read like independently but also can be read in one sitting which is really nice and you know it's great for someone who's starting to read independently but also great for just a great family read aloud or I read it and I'm in my 30s and I loved it right so uh I think it's great and there's a whole series it's a continuing series of and so me yes me is the first one and there's more coming out which I'm loving and I just you know I feel like she's better than Junie B or better than some of those other people in a lot of ways and no no shade to that but like she's just so adorable and so fun and and but also like teaches kids about this is what my culture looks like and this is what it looks like to be from this you know background and but in a way that's not like overbearing it's just supernatural because just a little girl talking about her life you know and I just love that series yeah I will say that I read the first one um and it was pleasantly surprised not that I didn't think I was gonna like it but I was amazed by how much I fell in love with this character because she's so rambunctious yes so fun and you know like you said it's just like you feel like you're part of her family in the sense that like they're talking about everyday things that are normal to them but are new to me yeah and so I liked hearing that perspective and seeing like their day-to-day -day lives but then it was done in such a way to where it didn't feel awkward it didn't feel clunky it was just like natural so 100 yeah. agree with that would recommend it to you all um well, i can kick us off through ya yeah i was gonna say let's move on to ya <laughs> yeah. so not gonna lie i did see this book on book talk um Ooh. on tiktok for those of you who are not as crazy obsessed with tiktok as i am the book that I choose for my YA selection is We Hunt the Flame by Hafsa Faisal. And this was unlike anything I've read in a really long time. Um, it's fantasy and it's about this huntress who people don't know that she is a she. Um, she wears a, a mysterious cloak. I guess she's mysterious wearing a cloak, hunts in this like crazy convoluted forest that uh, you know is actually most people don't come back alive from it um and you know like it's all these different kingdoms and there's like magic but there's also magic that has been like struck and pulled away from their um country and their world and the, like i'm not gonna lie like the first few pages of reading it was so intense because like the world building the like culture the colors the sounds like everything you felt i felt like i was literally placed in this whole other landscape um and so for like a second I was like reading it and I was like oh I have to get my bearings because I, I don't know what's happening I don't know what what is this you know and so basically this book was unlike anything I've read in a really long time um it was engaging I wanted to keep reading and when my <laughs> library hold expired or I guess I should say my e-copy expired I went out and bought a physical copy because oh. I needed to know what happened there is a sequel have not read it yet but that is my wife. Uh, I actually had a, have a new release that just came out not too long ago. And it's also written by a friend of mine, which is why I kind of had to shout it out. But it yeah. is Perfectly Carveen uh, by Olivia Abatai. And um, it's about a young girl. She's 14 years old. Carveen is um, 
you know, she's an Iranian American. She, her, uh, but she's also half um, Iranian, half American, because her mom is white. Her dad um, is Iranian. He came here as a child after the Iranian Revolution, and um, you know, and so she's being raised in between both cultures. But she just finished middle school. She's starting high school, and she's trying to figure out her place. The book starts out where she's on the last few days of summer break. She's at the beach and she has met the cutest boy ever. And they're having a great time at the beach. It's wonderful. She gets her first kiss. He asks her to be his girlfriend. They're going to go to the same school. And then two days later at orientation, she's like, hey, Wesley. And he's like, you're too loud. You're too much. We're breaking up. The end. And she's like, what? Like, my first boyfriend, he already broke up with me. Like, it's been two days. Who does that? And she's like clearly hysterical as much as my voice was just hysterical. And <laughs> she basically decides I have to become a better girl. I'm too much. And so she's watching all these, um, you know, they watch their favorite as part of her breakup, like helping her out. Her friends have her watch a bunch of romances because that's their favorite movies. So they're watching like The Little Mermaid and they're watching Princess Bride and they're watching, you know, some of those things. And she's like, as she's watching them, she thinks, oh, number one, all these girls are white. Number two, all these girls are quiet and not too loud. And they kind of like laugh at the boys' jokes. And, you know, they, and so she basically makes this plan of how to become the perfect girl so that she can get a date for homecoming, prove to her ex-boyfriend she's actually really great and maybe he'll come back to her. Um, and so in the process, she's like wrestling with her identity. Her parents also like notice. And what I love about this book actually that I, I'm so glad Olivia did because I feel like a lot of YA uh, sometimes like cut out parents. Her parents are super involved in her life and they should like, they have conversations where she's talking to her dad and her mom about, you know, am I pretty? And she has an aunt, um, you know, that she speaks to over Skype in Iran. That's also, she's like, you know, what if I do this and how do I do that and help me with my makeup and maybe I'm too loud and maybe I'm too this and her just figuring out like what does it mean to be loved what does it mean to love yourself what does it mean to be a good friend even because she also starts not being a very good friend in her quest to do these things and it's basically a great like she's a 14 year old who's a hot mess and is figuring out how to be not a hot mess and I mean at the end she's still 14 so come on like 14 yeah. are still hot messes but she grows a lot in uh, the course of the few months of the book covers as she just really learns to identify um, and also just embrace the, who she is, that she is truly perfect as she is and it's okay to be Harveen, exact all of who she is and to be loved for who she is. And it just, you know, maybe laugh out loud a bunch of times because Olivia is a funny writer and but also at moments that like, got me a bit teary eyed and just also made me just, you know, that representation matters, right? That's the reason why we're even doing this show. It's really important for um, kids to be able to see themselves in books um, and to just see themselves in the world around them and TV shows and movies. But I think it's also important for other kids to also see other identities because part of the story is like people making fun of her and being like, well, you're too this or like your name's weird and da, 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 and, like all these feelings and her wrestling with that. It also touches a little bit of uh, like um, Olivia was writing it during the Muslim ban. She finished what that was happening. Um, so like not even that long ago, you're right. And um, so she also does touch a little bit on how that impacts the family personally and their loved ones and some of the pressures they feel from their neighbors a little bit. Um, and it's just, there's just moments where I like, I laughed out loud, but I also like had to like dab my eyes a little bit here and there. And um, yeah, so that is Perfectly uh, Parveen by Olivia Abatai. Um, and then I do have a few honorable mentions. I will say that I actually have not read these, but they are honorable mentions in the sense that like they were, I started them and I was so excited to read them and it just came down to time. But if you're looking for other uh, books in the YA era, there's more than a pretty face uh, by Saeed M. Musud. And that's uh, like a, another, like a romance, young adult type story. And then Everything Sad is Untrue by Daniel Nayeri, which details his family story of immigrating from Iran to America and his own like just understanding of who he is and the choices that he makes and wrestling with his own identity. And this is a book that I've been told also like straddles a line between YA and adult because like it's YA in the sense that it starts out with a boy just standing in front of his classroom and telling people his story. But like the depths of what happens in the book like, and like the things that you have to think about is like also some things that like are feel very adult. Um, so I started those but not finished them but wanted to shout them out because they have been fun in but what I've got what I've already dabbled in has been enjoyable, so. No, that's fair. I only had one honorable mention for YA and it's Girl Gone Viral by Arvin Ahmadi. And it's, you know, a little bit like thriller, a little bit like tech is out to get you. I don't want to say too, too much more, um, but it's good. <laughs> it's you. Um, yeah. And like, we're on tech right now. Should we be concerned? Like, <laughs> hopefully this tech is not out to get us because we're just talking about books. We're not trying to take over the world. Or... Okay, we're doing something perfectly safe here, so we should be good. And then 
the last part of our show. As a reminder, each episode, we're highlighting one NSK Newstat finalist. The NSK Newstat Prize for Children's Literature has been awarded every other year to a living writer or author illustrator with significant achievement in children's or young adult literature. This month, we want to highlight, drum roll, please. <laughs> I don't know why I did that, but whatever. 2000. <laughs> And 21 finalist, Laurel Snyder. Yeah, Laurel was nominated by um, another middle grade um, author, um, Jonathan Oxier, whose books are delightful. Um, and um, both of their books oftentimes touch on Jewish things because they both have Jewish ancestry um, as part of their heritage. And so um, the representatives that she ended up being nominated for was Orphan Island, which I've read, and it's just a beautiful novel. It's about um, an island, this mysterious island where nine children live. And, you know, their food is taken care of, they have houses, everything they need is basically provided by the island. Um, and this is their lives, except once a year, a boat shows up bringing a new um, resident, usually about three to four years old, it's a child, it's a young child, and the oldest needs to leave. And so as the oldest, you know, the characters have to, the oldest one is supposed to train the next oldest to get them prepared to be the oldest so that when they depart, it's like whatever. And basically each, each kid helps the kid that's the youngest before them to kind of be like their mentor. Except this time, um, you know, one of the child, the oldest this year is like, I don't want to leave. And so her name is Ginny. And Ginny knows that like, okay, a new girl has arrived and it's my time to leave, uh, but she does not want to leave. Um, she, and so she holds out and decides to like leave the boat where it is and refuse to get in it. And so suddenly there's 10 kids on the island and the island starts changing as a result because she's broken the rules. And so suddenly some of that provision is changing. Some of the things that have been working really well are falling apart. The other kids are kind of like, no, like you should be going. She's like, no, things just need to stay the same. Things just need to stay the same. And she's fighting so hard to like resist change. And it kind of just, things just start falling apart. Um, so um, in the end, she has to make a choice one way or the other. Like, do I risk kind of staying and being, you know, solidly in what I know? Or do I go to the unknown and trust that I'll be okay. You know, they don't remember any of their lives before they showed up to the island. They have no memories. They have no clue what's out there once they get in the boat. Like, so there's all these fears that she has to wrestle with. And it ends on an ambiguous note. It actually reminds me a bit of The Giver, the way like it just kind of like ends and you're just thinking, what happened? But it also leaves you with this sense of like, she grew up, they're all growing up. Like all of these kids are growing up and they're wrestling with what does it look like to, you know, become older. And it's just such a beautiful novel that, um, I mean, I pretty much, I listened to it on one drive and it was beautiful and great. Um, Laurel has written a bunch of other books, which I'm excited to like dive into as well based on my experience with Orphan Island. Um, and so congratulations for being a finalist, Laurel, because you're a great writer, this is great. Yeah. Um, so we'll have all of the books featured in this episode linked in the description below. Um, but you know, like we said, always taking recs, always reading, always wanting to read more. Yes. Um, but if you want to find out more about World of Literature Today, you can check it out at worldliteraturetoday.org. Um, and now we'll leave you with some parting words of inspiration. So from Emily Dickinson, to travel far, there is no better ship than a book. And as Humpalahiri puts it, that's the thing about books. They let you travel without moving your feet. See you next time and happy reading. Happy reading.